This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can pre-order all the cards in this video by using the link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's that time again, set review season. The full card gallery for The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth went up earlier today, and that means I'll be reviewing every single card in the set over the next week or so to get you ready to play this new limited format at your pre-release or on Magic Arena. We're starting today with a look at all the multicolored and colorless cards. Multicolored cards are always a nice place to start because it gives us a better idea of what the format's archetypes are, and it also means we get to start by looking at some of the most powerful cards in the set. For each of these cards, I'll discuss how I think they will play in Limited, and I'll sum up my thoughts by using a letter grade. If you're new to my set reviews, you can find out what my grades mean by looking in the description. A couple of things to keep in mind as I look at these cards. First, I'm only evaluating them for limited and not in any other formats. And these are my evaluations of these cards before actually playing with them. So I, of course, won't be right about everything. I will be providing updates about the format here on the channel as I play it more and more. Additionally, only cards that appear in draft boosters will be reviewed in this series. Lastly, I want to remind you that I'm offering some set review related perks for both patrons and channel members. You get access to my ongoing notes during preview season, and by the end of the set review, you'll have a spreadsheet with all of my grades. If those perks sound interesting to you and you want to support the channel, you can find ways to become a channel member or a patron in the description. All right, without further ado, let's look at the first card in my March of the Machine limited set review which is Aragorn Company Leader. For one generic, a green and a white, he's a 3-3 legendary human ranger at rare. Whenever the ring tempts you, if you choose a creature other than Aragorn Company Leader as your ring bearer, put your choice of a counter from among First Strike, Vigilance, Death Touch, and Life Link on Aragorn. Whenever you put one or more counters on Aragorn, put one of each of those kinds of counters on up to one other target creature. So let's talk about this new mechanic first which is mentioned here the ring tempting you whenever you get tempted by the ring if it's the first time in the game you get an emblem called the ring and you make one of your creatures into your ring bearer your ring bearer gets all the bonuses you have unlocked from the ring every time you get tempted by the ring beyond the first you get the next effect down and you also have the option of choosing a ring bearer again you can only have one ring bearer at a time so aragorn gives you a huge payoff for the ring tempting you since he gives himself a keyword ability permanently and then because of his other ability, he can also give that ring bearer or some other creature you control one of those keyword counters. It also works, of course, with other counters, plus and plus one counters and things like that, which are certainly in the set. But overall, this Aragorn is reasonably efficient and it pays you off for one of the things that is the most prevalent in the set, which is the ring mechanic. It's really not going to be that hard to take full advantage of his ability to augment your board every time you get tempted by the ring. He looks really good, giving him a B+. Next, there's Aragorn the Uniter. For one red, one green, one white, and one blue, you get a 5-5 legendary human noble at mythic rare. Whenever you cast a white spell, you make a 1-1 white human creature token. Whenever you cast a blue spell, you scry two. Whenever you cast a red spell, Aragorn does three damage to target opponent. And whenever you cast a green spell, target creature gets plus four, plus four until end of turn. So if you can get your mana to the point where you can cast this, he's pretty nuts. Virtually any spell you cast will give you a powerful effect. Multicolored ones will feel particularly insane, and you get an above rate creature. There is definitely enough fixing in green and in the format in general for casting Aragorn to be doable. I think that allows him to sneak into the lower bomb range. He has to be killed and almost no matter what you do with your mana when you untap, your opponent's going to be in trouble. I'm giving him an A-. Next up it's Arwen Mortal Queen, which for one generic, a green, and a white is a 2-2 legendary elf noble at mythic rare. She enters with an indestructible counter on her. You can pay one generic and remove that indestructible counter. Another target creature gains indestructible until end of turn. Put a plus and plus one counter and a lifelink counter on that creature, and a plus and plus one counter and a lifelink counter on Arwen. An indestructible three mana 2-2 two, two is an okay card. It's a great place to stick counters or as an equipment, and it's a pretty big nuisance. Oftentimes, you'll get more value out of removing her indestructible counter, though, since buffing herself and another creature and giving them both lifelink is nice. She's kind of a modal card. You can play her as an indestructible Grey Ogre or as a 4-mana 3-3 with lifelink that puts a counter somewhere else, gives that other creature lifelink permanently and indestructible until end of turn. But 
Really, she's even better than that because you can choose when to use the effect. She's going to completely wreak havoc on combat because you can use this ability whenever. So if every one of your creatures attacking threatens to gain a plus and plus one counter, indestructible until another turn, and lifelink, it's going to be very difficult for your opponent to ever find a good way to block. She's going to produce a lot of blowouts. And in the end, she just gives you a ton of value for how much she costs, what her baseline is, and everything else, giving her a B+. Next up, it's Arwen Undomiel, which for a green and a blue is a 2-2 legendary elf noble at uncommon. Whenever you scry, you put a plus and plus one counter on target creature, and you can pay four generic a green and a blue to scry two. So this is one of the signpost uncommons for a blue-green. Signpost uncommons are multicolored uncommons that sort of tell you what a deck in the format is supposed to do based on its color pair. And in this case, obviously, you want to be scrying to get full value out of her because her ability is a super powerful payoff for scrying. Putting a counter on any target creature is a big deal. You can put them on her, you can put them anywhere else. She can, of course, also activate her own ability, but only in the later stages of the game, but it is nice she has that option later. There is plenty of scry stuff going on in blue-green to support this and for this to be a powerful card. One thing I like about this deck in general is that it sort of synergizes with itself in the sense that if you're scrying, you're going to be able to find more cards that pay you off for scrying or have scry themselves. So the synergy will be maybe a little easier to come by than it is in some of the other decks we've seen over the years in limited formats. Overall, she's a great payoff for the blue-green deck. I'm giving her a B-. Next, there's the Balrog Durin's Bane, which costs 5 generic, a black and a red, for a 7-5 legendary avatar demon at rare. It costs 1 less to cast for each permanent sacrifice this turn, has haste, can't be blocked except by legendary creatures. When the Balrog dies, destroy target artifact or creature an opponent controls. Decreasing its cost is possible, but it isn't that easy to pull off without spending mana to do it, so the discount isn't as appealing as it looks at first. Still, a 7-mana seven 7-5 seven with haste that is hard to block and destroys something when it dies is a pretty darn good card. Keep in mind, all ring bearers are going to be legendary, so this is going to be easier to block than it normally would, plus this set has a lot of legendaries in general. But still, it's hard for you not to get a 2-for-1 out of it, and it can do a ton of damage in a hurry, giving it a B+. Next up, it's Bilbo Retired Burglar, which for one generic, a blue and a red, is a 1-3 legendary halfling rogue at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, the ring tempts you. And whenever Bilbo deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. So Bilbo is going to be pretty tough for your opponent to block most of the time, since once the ring tempts you, that even just that first time, your ring bearer becomes difficult to block and you can choose Bilbo. This means that you can generate a bunch of treasure, thanks to his evasiveness. And it's great that even if he goes down, you get tempted by the ring again so that you can choose a different ring bearer to give that bonus to. Overall, another really good multicolored uncommon. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Butterbur Bree Innkeeper, which for two generic, a green and a white, is a 3-3 human peasant, a legendary one at uncommon. At the beginning of your instep, if you don't control a food, create a food. So green-white is about food tokens, as this signpost uncommon shows you. The stats here aren't very good, but being able to get a food token anytime you don't have one seems pretty nice, especially if you have something to sacrifice it to every turn. You can also just sacrifice it to gain life every turn too, of course, and just get a new food every time, which is nice giving this a C+. Next up, it's Denethor, Ruling Steward, which for one generic, a white and a black, is a 2-4 human noble at uncommon. At the beginning of your instep, if a creature died under your control this turn, create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. You can pay two generic and sacrifice another creature. Each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life. Playing this in your second main phase after something died in combat is going to feel pretty good, as at that point, Denethor is a 3-mana 2-4 and a 1-1 one, one token. And that's a great rate. Plus, he can give up creatures to drain life, and you can do that once every turn without really having to give up a creature because you can just sacrifice the token every time, and then you get a new token at the end of your turn. I'm giving him a B-. Next up, it's Doors of Durin, which for three generic, a red, and a green is a rare legendary artifact. Whenever you attack, scry two, then you may reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, put it onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Until your next turn, it gains Trample, if you control a dwarf, and Hexproof, if you control an elf. This will usually do something the turn you play it, and that's important because it costs five mana. Once you attack and scry two, you have a pretty solid shot at revealing a creature that this will let you just put into play attacking. You will whiff sometimes, but in your typical 15 creature deck, when you get to scry two, you're normally going to find what you're looking for. 
Of course, the creature isn't always going to be something that is amazing for you to have to put into play tapped and attacking, but an extra body is usually going to be welcome if you already had a good attack. I think this will do enough to be a pretty good card overall, even if sometimes it won't pan out the way you want it to. I'm giving it a B+. Next up, it's Elrond, Master of Healing, which for two generic, a green, and a blue is a 4-4 legendary elf noble at rare. Whenever you scry, put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to X target creatures, where X is the number of cards looked at while scrying this way. Whenever a creature you control, the plus one plus one counter on it becomes a target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. This is a great payoff for scrying. Elrond is very capable of rapidly growing your board, while also making it a pain for your opponent to deal with creatures with counters on them. Most of the time, you're going to want to put a counter on him as quickly as you can, so that if your opponent does take him down, you're at least getting a two for one. He's also got good base stats. He seems very, very easy to get going in blue-green, and left unchecked, he's going to win you the game. His one shortcoming is that he usually won't deliver immediate value, but I think he sneaks into the lower bomb range nonetheless, giving him an A-. minus. Next up, it's Eowyn Fearless Knight, which for two generic, a red and a white, is a 3-4 legendary human knight at rare. She's got haste, and when she enters the battlefield, exile target creature and opponent controls with greater power. Legendary creatures you control gain protection from each of that creature's colors until end of turn. She won't always be able to remove something when she comes down, but when she can't, she's probably one of the larger creatures on the battlefield, so that's not a bad fail case, and most of the time she will have something to remove. When she does exile something, she's going to feel pretty insane because she'll be a 4-mana 3-4 with haste that probably has protection from one of the key colors in your opponent's deck, and she may have given protection to some of your other legendary creatures. There are lots of legendaries in this set, so that line of text does actually matter. So yeah, she's a 4-mana 3-4 with haste that's also a removal spell, like, I don't know, 70% of the time. That makes her pretty awesome. If it was 100% of the time, she'd be a bomb. As is, I have her at B+. Next up, it's Faramir, Prince of Athelion, which for two generic, a white and a blue, is a 3-3 rare legendary human noble. At the beginning of your instep, choose an opponent. At the beginning of that player's next instep, you draw a card if they didn't attack you that turn. Otherwise, create three 1-1 white human soldier creature tokens. The base stats here aren't good, but Faramir makes sure you get a ton of value every single turn. Either your opponent attacks you and you get an extra card, or they don't attack you and you get three 1-1 tokens. Both of those options are great for you, though on average the three tokens are probably going to be better than drawing the card. Your opponent has some control over this, of course, and can make things happen in such a way that the least bad thing for them happens, but in this case you're happy either way, and sometimes they won't have much choice depending on the board state. I'm giving Faramir a B+. Next, there's Flame of Anor, which for one generic, a blue, and a red, is a rare instant. It says, choose one. If you control a wizard as you cast a spell, you may choose two instead. Target player draws two cards. Destroy target artifact. Flame of Anor deals five damage to target creature. This card would be awesome even without the wizard upside. Three mana to do five to a creature is always premium removal, and it offers additional options. Then, if you do have a wizard, it can feel truly insane, as drawing two and killing a creature or destroying an artifact for three mana is nuts. It'll feel like a bomb if you have enough wizards in your deck, but I think the overall grade for it is a B+. Next, there's Friendly Rivalry, which for a red and a green is an uncommon instant. It says target creature you control and up to one other target legendary creature you control. Each deal damage equal to their power to target creature you don't control. Even if you don't have a legendary creature around to make this even better, it would be a very good removal spell. If you do have a legendary creature around, this will be capable of killing pretty much everything for only two mana. And yes, it does have the downside that this type of removal always has. If you aren't using two creatures to do the damage, you can get two for one if you're not careful. But if you pick your spots right with this, it's going to be amazing. And it's an instant, so finding those spots is pretty easy, giving this a B. Next up, it's Frodo Baggins, which for a green and a white is a 1-3 halfling scout and uncommon. Whenever he or another legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, the ring tempts you. As long as Frodo is your ring bearer, it must be blocked if able. This card has a really weird design. A 2-mana 1-3 that has the ring tempt you is a solid card, but the fact that Frodo forces things to block him is really weird, especially because the very first effect you get from the ring is that your creature can't be blocked by creatures with more power than it has, and Frodo has one power, so there aren't that many things that are going to be able to block him anyway. The ring does eventually give you a bunch of other nice effects that do do things to your opponent when they block, but again, if Frodo is your ring bearer, very few creatures will be able to block him anyway. None of this makes him a bad card. 
you know, it is just upside. It's just weird, narrow upside on a card that's already pretty good. I'm giving this a C plus. Next up, it's Galadriel of Lothlorien, which for one generic, a green and a blue, is a 3-3 legendary elf noble at rare. When the ring tempts you, if you chose a creature other than Galadriel of Lothlorien as your ring bearer, scry three. Whenever you scry, you may reveal the top card of your library. If a land is revealed this way, put it onto the battlefield tapped. She's got decent base stats, and getting to scry three when the ring tempts you is a big deal. Once you're scrying that much, it feels pretty close to drawing a card because you gain so much control over your next few draws. And on top of that, she also lets you effectively draw cards and ramp when you scry. She feels like a very accessible value engine, giving her a B+. Next up, it's Gandalf the Grey, which for three generic, a blue, and a red is a 3-4 legendary avatar wizard at rare. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, choose one that hasn't been chosen. You may tap or untap target permanent. Gandalf the Grey deals 3 damage to each opponent. Copy target instant or sorcery spell you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. Put Gandalf on top of its owner's library. These effects are all pretty nice things to tack on to instants and sorceries, especially the ability to copy a spell. 3 damage to the opponent and tapping or untapping something isn't always going to be that useful, but it, I'll take it. Eventually, you can bounce Gandalf to the top of your deck and reset everything. And you can also use that to protect him from removal, which is kind of nice. It doesn't have great stats, and not all of the effects are amazing. But it seems like he'll be challenging to kill and have a big impact on the game if your opponent can't deal with him, giving him a B+. Next up, it's Gandalf Sanction, which for one generic, a blue and a red, is an uncommon sorcery. It deals X damage to target creature, where X is the number of instant sorcery cards in your graveyard. Excess damage is dealt to that creature's controller instead. So this is a very signposty blue-red uncommon. Obviously, as it often is, blue-red is a spell deck. And this is another pretty nice signpost uncommon. It can be kind of a blank card in the early game, but by the mid to late game, this is going to be capable of killing most things. Doing excess damage to the opponent definitely matters too, because sometimes when you're in a spell deck, in a format where you're doing something that's based on the number of spells in your graveyard or whatever, you do tons of overkill damage that just doesn't matter. This actually makes it matter. So if you have like seven instants and sorceries in your graveyard and you kill something with three toughness that you needed to kill and you basically get to trample with that damage, I mean, it's going to feel pretty great. I'm giving this a B minus. Next up, it's Gimli Mournful Avenger, which for one generic, a red and a green is a 3-2 dwarf warrior at rare. It has indestructible as long as two or more creatures died under your control this turn. Whenever another creature you control dies, put a plus and plus one counter on Gimli. When this ability resolves for the third time this turn, Gimli fights up to one target creature you don't control. This feels really weird for a red-green card since... He really likes it when stuff dies. He also doesn't give you a way to make your creatures die either, which is awkward. In other words, setting it up so Gimli is indestructible during combat, which is usually when you want that to be the case, is pretty difficult. Getting a plus and plus one counter on him here or there is doable, but I wouldn't really count on that resolving for the third time in a turn very often. But a three mana 3-2 that grows throughout the game and has some additional niche upside is a pretty good card, giving it a B-. Next up, it's Gwai here, the Windlord, which for four generic, a white and a blue, is a 4-4 uncommon legendary bird noble. It costs two less to cast as long as you've drawn two or more cards this turn. It's got flying and vigilance, and other birds you control have vigilance. This is another signpost uncommon. Blue-white is about drawing extra cards. There's also several birds. It's not a huge theme, but you can see Gwai here is giving all your birds vigilance. So if this always costs six mana, it would probably be a C- minus at best. There are some other birds to give Vigilance to, like I said, in a 6-mana 4-4 with Flying and Vigilance isn't a disaster, though it also just isn't something that would always make your deck. But the good news is, paying 4 for this is doable. The bad news is, you probably had to spend some extra mana to draw that extra card, so that probably still means that this won't be coming down on turn 4 all that often. Instead, it will be something that helps you double spell on turn 6 or so, which is fine, but not amazing, giving this a C+. Next up, it's King of the Oathbreakers, which for two generic, a white and a black, is a 3-3 legendary spirit noble at rare. It's got flying. Whenever it or another spirit you control becomes a target of a spell, it phases out. And whenever King of the Oathbreakers or another spirit you control phases in, create a tapped 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. This is a 4-mana 3-3 flyer that's pretty impossible for your opponent to kill. If you do put them in a bind where they have to make this phase out in order to avoid dying, that's going to feel pretty good since it'll come back and bring a friend along for the ride. Of course, if you have other spirits around, this does get even better. But even without them, this is fairly efficient and your opponent is going to be hard-pressed to permanently deal with it, giving it a B+. 
Next up, it's Legolas, Counter of Kills, which for two generic, a green and a blue, is a 2-3 legendary elf archer at Uncommon. He's got Reach. Whenever you scry, if Legolas is tapped, you may untap it. Do this only once each turn. And whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, put a plus one plus one counter on Legolas. His ability to untap is reasonably easy to trigger. We've already seen a bunch of blue-green cards that like scrying, but it's also not the most exciting thing in the world. His ability to grow is where the real value is, but green-blue is awkwardly a color pair that isn't that good at killing things outside of combat, which limits just how good this can be. Additionally, his base stats aren't remotely impressive. For a sign boast uncommon meant to represent one of the franchise's most iconic characters, this is pretty disappointing when it comes to limited. I think it's just a C. Next up, it's Lotho, Corrupt Sheriff, which for a white and a black is a 2-1 legendary halfling rogue at rare, and whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, you lose one life and create a treasure token. Getting treasure when people cast two spells in a turn is pretty nice, and it can sort of fuel itself since if you have treasure, it'll be easier for you to cast two spells in a turn. That said, this won't really start triggering in most cases until the later stages of the game when a treasure is usually less valuable, and the life loss on the card could occasionally be a problem, giving it a C+. Next up, it's Mahur, Urukai Captain, which for a black and a red is a 2-2 uncommon legendary orc soldier with menace. If one or more plus one plus one counters would be put on an army goblin or orc you control, that many plus one plus one plus one counters are put on it instead. This is mostly useful alongside a mass, a mechanic we haven't actually seen in this video yet, but it's a mechanic where you create a orc army token and it comes into play with some number of plus one plus one counters on it. So this will give you one more when you amass. And that's what Black Red is about. It's about goblins and orcs and armies. While amass isn't the only way you're going to be putting counters on things, it is the one that's going to matter the most. And that's a pretty nice upgrade to those sorts of effects because there are a lot of them in Black Red. And on top of that, this is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with Menace, which is just a good rate anyway. Often if you play that on turn 2, it gets in for like 4 before your opponent can do anything about it. That makes this a pretty nice signpost uncommon, giving it a B. Next up, it's Mary Esquire of Rohan, which costs a red and a white for a 2-2 two -two legendary halfling knight at rare. It's got haste. It has first strike as long as it's equipped. And whenever you attack with Mary and another legendary creature, draw a card. This seems pretty good. Drawing a card with it and giving it first strike are fairly obtainable things, even if they aren't necessarily always going to happen. And a 2-2 with haste as the baseline isn't bad. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's the Mouth of Sauron, which costs three blue and a black for a 3-4 legendary human advisor at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, target player mills three cards, then amass Orcs X, where X is the number of instant sorcery cards in that player's graveyard. This means you put X plus and plus one counters on an army you control. It's also an orc. If you don't control an army, create a 0-0 zero, zero black orc army creature token first. So if you get a mass two or more out of this, it's going to feel like a great deal. And by the later stages of the game, it could make your army absolutely massive or just create a new massive army for you. There will be some awkward times where you can only amass zero or one, but you do have two separate graveyards to rely on. So your chances of getting good value out of this are pretty high. Obviously, the black-red deck is more of an aggressive amass goblin orc deck, whereas the blue-black deck is a grindier one that relies on milling itself and the opponent and getting value out of amass. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Old Man Willow, which for two generic, a black and a green, is a star-star legendary tree folk at Uncommon. Its power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control, and when it attacks, you may sacrifice another creature or a token. When you do, target creature an opponent controls gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. This is another great signpost in common. At worst, it's going to have passable stats that get better throughout the game, and the attack effect is pretty strong. You won't always have something to sacrifice, but keep in mind you can sacrifice expendable creatures, but you can also sacrifice food tokens, which are generally quite expendable, and there are a lot of them in black-green, and that's really the ideal thing to give up here. There are going to be a ton of situations where this can attack and easily remove opposing creatures by giving up something else. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Pippin, Guard of the Citadel, which for a blue and a white is a 2-2 legendary halfling soldier at rare. It's got Vigilance and Ward 1. You can tap it, and another target creature you control gains protection from the card type of your choice until end of turn. 
A two-minute tutu with Vigilance and Ward 1 is a decent starting point, and Pippin comes with a really strong ability. Protection from an entire card type is pretty great, and means that Pippin can not only help your creatures dodge removal, he can also make your creatures unblockable in many situations. Of course, he can't use the ability on himself, so most of the time, your opponent will just prioritize getting rid of him, but at least Ward 1 makes that a little bit more challenging. Still, the fail case here is a nice card, and the ability to protect stuff can be a game breaker. I'm giving it a B. Next up, it's Prince Imrahil the Fair, which for a white and a blue is a 2-2 legendary human noble at Uncommon. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token. So another blue-white signpost Uncommon that likes it when you draw your second card. In this case, you get a 1-1 token. Even if you can only trigger that once, this is going to feel like a pretty good deal. And triggering it more than that doesn't really seem out of the question in blue-white. I'm giving this a B-. Next up, it's Ring Sight, which for one generic, a blue, and a black is an uncommon sorcery. The ring tempts you. Search your library for a card that shares a color with a legendary creature you control, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. Three mana tutors don't tend to be good and limited. After all, the average power level of the cards in your deck isn't all that high, and you don't end up netting any cards when you cast this. You go down a card and get one back, so you break even, and that just isn't worth three mana most of the time. And this tutor actually makes you jump through hoops, or it doesn't tutor at all. The real question is, is the ring tempts you enough upside to offset the fact that it is inefficient at best and sometimes won't tutor at all? Well, it probably keeps it from being an F, but just barely. I just don't think this is going to be very good and limited, giving it a D-. Next up, it's Rise of the Witch King, which for two generic, a black and a green, is an uncommon sorcery. Each player sacrifices a creature. If you sacrificed a creature this way, you may return another target permanent card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Four mana is a lot for a symmetrical edict, but the ability to return any permanent to the battlefield makes up for that to some extent. Since it lets you get any permanent, you do have a better chance than usual of having something you can bring back when you do this, but the best thing to bring back is usually still going to be a creature. It does also take something away from your opponent, but it will frequently not be something that meaningful. This might combine nicely with the land cyclers in the format or something, but for now I think it's merely solid. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Samwise Gamgee, which for a green and a white is a 2-2 legendary halfling peasant at rare. Whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, create a food token, and you can sacrifice three foods and return target historic card from your graveyard to your hand. Artifacts, legendaries, and sagas are historic. This can generate a ton of food, and he also offers a pretty amazing payoff for that, as reanimating a historic card from your graveyard can be a big deal. The set has enough cards that are historic for that ability to matter. He looks like a pretty amazing value engine, giving him a B+. Next up, it's Saruman of Many Colors, which for three generic, a white, a blue, and a black, is a 5-4 legendary avatar wizard at Mythic Rare. It has Ward, discard an enchantment, instant, or sorcery card. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, each opponent mills two cards. When one or more cards are milled this way, exile target enchantment, instant, or sorcery card with equal or lesser mana value than that spell from an opponent's graveyard. Copy the exiled card. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. I think it's funny that his name is Saruman of Many Colors, but he's only three colors. This is one of the funny things that can happen when they use a different IP because it doesn't actually make that much sense in the context of magic. But either way, this looks like an incredibly powerful card. The ward means your opponent will often just not be able to target it. And when they can, they have to two for one themselves. And they are going to want to target it, since if you ever cast two spells in a turn, it's very likely to give you a free card, and that's tough to beat, giving him an A. Next up, it's Sauron, the Dark Lord, which costs three generic, a blue, a black, and a red for a 7-6 legendary avatar horror at Mythic Rare. It has Ward, sacrifice a legendary artifact or a legendary creature. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, a mass orcs one. Whenever an army you control deals combat damage to a player, the ring tempts you. Whenever the ring tempts you, you may discard your hand if you do draw four cards. Unsurprisingly, Sauron is incredibly strong. Even just finding a way to target him is going to be a challenge, even in a set that is this legendary heavy. And even if you can pay the ward cost, like with Saruman, you're still two for one yourself at the very least. In fact, it's even worse since whoever controls Sauron also gets to amass one before Sauron dies. Add in the fact that this can give you insane value from the ring and it can reload your hand, and we're talking about a bomb, giving this an A. Next up, it's Sauron's Ransom, which for one generic, a blue and a black is a rare instant. It says, choose an opponent. They look at the top four cards of your library and separate them into a face-down pile and a face-up pile. Put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. The ring tempts you. 
This is a fun take on a factor fiction-like effect, and I think it's pretty good overall. No matter what happens, the ring tempts you and you get a two-for-one, and it's hard for that not to be good when you're spending three mana at instant speed. That said, there's always a chance you get two lands when you don't want them, or expensive spells when you can't cast them. But the fact is, you still get significant card advantage, coupled with some upside. I think that makes this a B-. Next up, it's Shadow Summoning, which for a white and a black is an uncommon sorcery. It says create two tapped 1-1 one, one white spirit creature tokens with flying. Getting two 1-1 one, one flyers for two mana is a nice rate, though it is a problem that they enter tapped. One of the nice things about a card that makes multiple bodies is often that they're good whether you are ahead or behind, but this one's not going to be very good when you're behind since they can't block that first turn. Still, if you play this on turn two, it's going to do a great job of pressuring your opponent, giving it a C+. Next up, it's Shadowfax, Lord of Horses. For three generic, a red and a white is a 4-4 legendary horse at Uncommon. Horses you control have haste. And when Shadowfax attacks, you can put a creature card with lesser power from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. This is the kind of card people are going to overrate. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but people always think a creature that can put one into play from your hand is way better than they actually are in Limited. The main problem is just that you don't often have another creature to put into play in Limited. Don't get me wrong, when you do, Shadowfax will feel insane, especially if you do it the turn you cast it, which you can do because Shadowfax will have haste. But it just won't happen as much as you think it will. Still, the baseline here is effectively a 5-mana 4-4 with haste. And the upside matters, it's just not as good as it might look, giving this a C+. Next up, it's Shagrat Lootbearer, which for two generic, a black and a red, is a 4-4 legendary orc soldier at rare. When it attacks, attach up to one target equipment to it, then amass orcs X, where X is a number of equipment attached to Shagrat. This has a reasonable floor as a 4-mana 4-4, though I don't think you really end up playing it unless you've got at least a couple of equipment in your deck. Once you do... Amassing every time this attacks is nice, as is getting to equip something for free, giving it a C+. Next up, it's Sharky, Tyrant of the Shire, which for two generic, a blue and a black, is a 2-4 legendary avatar rogue at rare. Activated abilities of lands your opponents control can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. Sharky, Tyrant of the Shire, has all activated abilities of lands your opponent control, except mana abilities. Mana of any type can be spent to activate Sharky's abilities. This isn't going to do anything in Limited. There are some rare lands that we'll see later in this video that he can shut down, and stealing their abilities is cool too. And there's a couple of commons, but the ones that aren't rare don't really matter very much, and gaining and shutting down their abilities is pretty meaningless. That combined with a bad stat line means this just isn't something you're ever going to play in Limited. Maybe sighted in if your opponent has like four lands this actually affects, but that's almost never going to happen, giving it an F. Next up, it's Shilob, Child of Ungoliant, which for four generic, a black and a green, is an 8-8 spider demon. It's legendary, of course, at rare. It's got Death Touch and Ward 2. Other spiders you control have Death Touch and Ward 2. Whenever another creature dealt damage this turn by a spider you control dies, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a food artifact with two, tap, sacrifice this artifact, you gain three life, and it loses all other card types. This is a way above rate creature that gives you food with big upside every time one of your opponent's creatures gets killed by it, and they are going to get killed because Shilob has death touch and is absolutely massive. If you have other spiders around, this gets way sillier, but even on its own, it's a massive problem that your opponent has to deal with immediately. And Ward 2 makes that easier said than done. I'm giving it an A-. Next up, it's Smeagol, Helpful Guide, which for one generic, a black and a green, is a 4-2 legendary halfling horror at rare. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn under your control, the ring tempts you. Whenever the ring tempts you, target opponent reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a land. Put that card onto the battlefield tapped under your control and the rest into their graveyard. He's got decent base stats and it isn't overly difficult to get the ring to tempt you here either. In fact, you can do something as simple as attack into a trade, then play this in your second main phase, at which point you get the ring going, and when you do that, you end up ramping your mana, which is pretty nice. While the ramp part of Smeagol's tempted by the ring upside matters less and less as the game goes on, the fact you're milling your opponent eventually becomes more relevant, and I think that will work out fairly nicely. Smeagol is going to give you a lot of value all game long, giving him a B. 
Next up, it's Strider, Ranger of the North, which for two generic, a red and a green, is a 4-4 legendary human ranger at Uncommon, has landfall. That means whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, something happens. In this case, target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Then, if that creature has power four or greater, it gains first strike until end of turn. This starts with decent base stats, and this is a strong landfall effect. He can always just give the boost to himself, which means he'll often rumble as a 5-5 with first strike, Something that's formidable on virtually every board state. He can also spread the love around, of course, which is great, because it can enable you to attack with more of your creatures. Red-Green is also a ramp deck in the format, so getting more than one land into play in a turn and triggering this more than once is very doable in the color pair, giving it a B. Next up, it's Theoden, King of Rohan, which for one generic, a red and a white, is a 2-3 legendary human noble at Uncommon. Whenever Theoden or another human enters the battlefield under your control, target creature gains double strike until end of turn. Red-white is about humans, so this is going to work pretty nicely. And I would already be in on a 3-mana 2-3 that gives something double strike when it enters the battlefield. That would already be a really good card because it's going to make basically any creature into a useful attacker but this can trigger way more often than just that one time especially if you're in red white and you have a bunch of humans making multiple human tokens in a turn is pretty nuts overall this has an amazing baseline and then really awesome upside i'm giving it a b next up it's tom bombadil which costs one mana of each color it's a four four legendary god bard at mythic rare as long as there are four or more lore counters among sagas you control, Tom Bombadil has Hexproof and Indestructible. Whenever the final chapter ability of a saga you control resolves, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a saga card. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This ability triggers only once each turn. There are sagas that uncommon in this set, but it still seems like it's going to be a significant challenge to get him going. That combined with the challenging mana cost means only a very narrow number of decks are actually going to be able to make this work. That said, if you do have great mana and five or more sagas, he's pretty insane. I think that means we need to give him a build around grade. He's probably a D in your typical deck in the format that will both have kind of a hard time casting it and maybe two sagas, and an A- in a deck that gets there on mana and sagas. Next up, it's Ugluk of the White Hand, which for two generic, a black and a red, is a 3-3 legendary orc soldier at Uncommon. Whenever another creature you control dies, put a plus and plus one counter on Ugluk of the White Hand. If that creature was a goblin or orc, put two plus and plus one counters on Ugluk instead. Black Red has lots of creatures with these types, and some sacrifice stuff going on too, of course, but I'm still kind of worried that growing this simply won't be all that easy, and that's kind of a problem, since it starts as a 4-mana 3-3. Three, three. I think this is a C+. All right, those are the multicolored cards. Let's move into the colorless ones. First up, there's Anduril, Flame of the West, which for three generic mana is a mythic rare legendary artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus three, plus one. Whenever equipped creature attacks, create two tapped 1-1 one, one white spirit creature tokens with flying. If that creature is legendary, instead create two of those tokens that are tapped and attacking, and you can equip this for two. This is really good. The base stats boost, honestly, is pretty good and would already make it playable, but the fact you generate two 1-1s one every time you attack with something that's equipped with this is amazing, especially because those 1-1 one one flyers are then a good place to stick the equipment and just keep on going. This makes any creature into a major threat, and the fact it can just move around and wreak havoc means your opponent is going to have a very hard time beating this. One kind of funny thing is that sometimes you'd rather the tokens not enter tapped in attacking, like if you need the extra bodies to block or you're sending them in to just get easily blocked and then what's the point? So keep that in mind, that's not 100% upside. So sometimes it might be better to put this not on a legendary creature, but either way, this is a bomb. I'm giving it an A. It's also great that it's colorless. It's the kind of bomb you can first pick and it's going to see play in 100% of your decks. Next up, it's Barrow Blade, which costs one generic for an artifact equipment at Uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one. Whenever equipped creature blocks or becomes blocked by a creature, that creature loses all abilities until end of turn, and you can equip it for one. A plus one plus one equipment that costs one to play and one to equip is like a C minus. It offers a decent boost at a low rate, gets better in a format that cares about artifacts and equipment, and there's enough of that in this format for that to matter. The additional upside here is nice as it makes it more difficult for your opponent to find an advantageous way to block or attack through your creatures. The fact that abilities are lost until end of turn will often have ramifications outside of combat too, giving this a C. 
Next up, it's Ent Draft Basin, which for two generic is an uncommon artifact. You can pay X and tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature with power X. Activate only as a sorcery. I think this looks pretty awful. Sure, one mana to put a counter on a 1-1 one, one isn't a terrible deal. And as a mana sink, I guess maybe you can do worse, but it'll eventually be fairly expensive to put counters on things, and the fact it does it only at sorcery speed is a pretty big problem. This just seems too clunky. I think it's an F. Next up, it's Glamdring, which for two generic mana is a mythic rare legendary artifact equipment. Equipped creature has first strike and gets plus one plus zero for each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard. Whenever a equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand with mana value less than or equal to that damage without paying its mana cost, and you can equip it for three generic. So if you're in a spell deck like blue black or blue red, Glamdring is likely to offer enough of a bonus to be well worth playing. I mean, just plus two plus zero in first strike, plus this additional upside is enough for this to be worth it. So if you're going higher than that, things will get really silly. I will say that the ability to cast a spell from your hand without paying for it is a lot less impressive than it sounds, since it won't line up that well in limited. You aren't always going to have a spell to cast to take advantage of it, and even when you do, it doesn't always make that much of a difference. Still, the baseline of the card is basically Rune Chanter's Pike, and it has some additional upside, giving it a B. Next up, it's Horn of Gondor, which for three generic is a rare legendary artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token. You can pay three generic and tap it to create X 1-1 white human soldier creature tokens, where X is the number of humans you control. This kind of reminds me of Pack Rat, and that was one of the biggest limited bombs of all time. The turn you play this, you're getting a three mana 1-1 token. That's not a good deal, but the horn can quickly populate the board over subsequent turns, eventually completely getting out of hand. If you already have a bunch of humans in play, it can get going even faster. The downside is, you don't always have time or mana to just crank out a bunch of human tokens, and this will just be too clunky and slow in some situations. Once you have this in play with a few humans, though, spending your turn making tokens is probably just going to be better than doing anything else. I think this is a bomb, maybe not quite on the level of Pack Rat. After all, it costs more and it does its thing a lot more slowly, but I think it's an A-. minus. Next up, it's Horn of the Mark, which for two generic is a rare legendary artifact. Whenever two or more creatures you control attack a player, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand, put the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order. This does nothing on its own, but if you can trigger it, you're pretty much always going to draw a card off the effect. Attacking with two or more creatures isn't always doable, though it does become easier when you know you're going to get a card back out of the trigger. It is nice, this is fairly cheap, as you can play it on a turn, attack with two or more things to get that extra creature, and then maybe you just have mana left over to cast it. There will be times where you can't do anything with this, make no mistake. Sometimes it's a little bit of a win more card too, because if you can attack with two things, you're probably already in a pretty good position. But I think this does a good enough job at getting you extra cards that it's worth taking fairly highly. I'm giving it a B-. Next, it's Inherited Envelope, which for three generic is a common artifact. When it enters the battlefield, a ring tempts you, and it can tap to add one mana of any color. Manalith doesn't tend to be that good in Limited. Using up a card and spending three mana just for fixing and ramp can be rough. Though adding the ring tempts you to the mix does do enough for this to be fixing you'll turn to sometimes. I'm giving it a C-. Next, there's Lemboss, which for two generic mana is a common artifact food. When it enters the battlefield, you scry one and draw a card. You can pay two and sacrifice it to gain three life. And when it's put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you shuffle it into your library. This seems pretty solid. Scry one plus draw one when it enters the battlefield is nice. That lines up nicely with two different archetypes. The blue-white one likes drawing extra cards. The blue-green one likes to scry. It's also a food, which the green-white deck cares about. And it also has this cool additional upside of keeping you from milling out, which could actually matter in some rare cases. Overall, I think this is a C. Next up, it's a Mirror of Galadriel, which for two generic is an uncommon legendary artifact. You can pay five generic and tap it to scry one, then draw a card. It costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control. Even in a set with this many legendaries, I'm not very confident that you'll be able to get this ability down far enough, consistently enough, for this to be anything special. I guess if you can get it down to three, the effect will feel passable, but you really need to go to two or less to feel like you're getting a good deal, and the floor on this card is miserable. I'm giving it a C. 
Next up, it's Mithril Coat, which for three generic is a rare legendary artifact equipment. It's got flash, it's got indestructible. When it enters the battlefield, attach it to target legendary creature you control. Equip creature has indestructible, equip for three generic. Just indestructibility? really isn't that impressive of a boost. The main problem being that the creature needs to already be good, otherwise it isn't really worth making indestructible. For this to be worth it, it really needs you to have a legendary creature to attach it to for free at instant speed too, because at that point you're probably saving your creature from removal or helping it win combat. Even in a set with this many legendaries though, you just, you can't count on that, and this will feel clunky as heck when you have to pay three to play it and equip it. I think this is a D. Next up, it's the One Ring for four generic. It's a mythic rare legendary artifact. It's indestructible. When it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, you gain protection from everything until your next turn. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life for each bird encounter on the One Ring, and you can tap it and put a bird encounter on it, then draw a card for each bird encounter on it. This looks pretty powerful. It does have a real effect the turn you play it as protection from everything means your opponent won't be able to attack you or target you with anything. So it's basically a fog effect. Not something I usually love in limited, but it's attached to a real card here and that makes a difference. It will quickly start drawing you cards after that. You do have to lose life and stuff, but this can draw you so many cards so quickly that you're going to be able to use them to win the game before it matters most of the time. I'm giving this a B plus. Next up, it's Palantir of Orthonk, which for three generic is a mythic rare legendary artifact. At the beginning of your end step, put an influence counter on Palantir of Orthonk and scry two. Then target opponent may have you draw a card. If that player doesn't, you mill X cards, where X is the number of influence counters on Palantir of Orthonk, and that player loses life equal to the total mana value of those cards. Scry two every end step is an okay effect, though getting it out of a card that doesn't really impact the board is less than ideal, though a little more acceptable in the blue-green deck, which will give you effects that do impact the board when you scry. And overall, I think maybe the Palantir is just too slow to be great. The first couple turns when your opponent goes with the mill option, it'll likely do very little. And then once they can't safely choose that option anymore, they're likely to give you cards. But you also have to be pressuring your opponent in some way for them to be that concerned about their life total. It definitely has an impressive ceiling as a value engine, but it's gonna take a lot of turns to start doing something meaningful. I'm giving it a B minus. Next up, it's File of Galadriel, which for three generic is a rare legendary artifact. If you would draw a card while you have no cards in hand, draw two cards instead. If you would gain life while you have five or less life, you gain twice that much life instead, and it can tap to add one mana of any color. A three mana mana rock that can tap for one mana of any color generally isn't very good in limited. If a format turns out to have more ramp or multicolor stuff going on, it can be better, and there is a little bit of that in the set, but Mana Lith on its own definitely isn't very good. This does have additional upside, but it is worth noting both are fairly narrow. The life gain part especially so, since you need to both have five or less life and do something that will gain you life. It'll happen sometimes, and when it does, it's going to feel great, but it's not going to happen that often. I'm more interested in the file drawing extra cards, as that's where the real power is. Most games that go relatively long result in you having an empty hand, and it also means that you'll probably be able to play both things you draw a lot of the time and keep on drawing extra every turn. So early on, it's like an almost passable mana rock, and then in the late game, it will grind you out some wins, maybe even gaining you some extra life. I think overall, that makes this a B-. minus. Next, there's Shire Scarecrow, which for two generic mana is a 0-3 artifact creature Scarecrow at common. It's got Defender, and you can pay one generic and add one mana of any color. Activate only once each turn. A 2-mana 0-3 defender isn't normally worth a card. Obviously, it can't trade with anything, and it can't even block for that long very effectively, but this does do an okay job of filtering your mana. It's a source of fixing you can turn to if you need to, giving it a C-. Next, there's Sting, the Glinting Dagger, which costs 2 generic. It's a rare legendary equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one and has haste. At the beginning of each combat, untap equipped creature. Equipped creature has first strike as long as it's blocking or blocked by a goblin or orc, and you can equip it for two generic mana. Two to play and two to equip for the stats boost and haste is pretty close to an okay card. So the fact it also offers pseudo vigilance and upside against some of the most plentiful creatures in the format makes this pretty nice, giving it a B. Next up, there's Stone of Erek, which for one generic mana is an uncommon legendary artifact. If a creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. You can pay two and sack it to exile target player's graveyard and draw a card. 
There is some graveyard stuff going on in this format, but nowhere near enough for this to be main deck material. Sure, it replaces itself in a worst case, but that's just not enough these days. This is an F in your main deck and a C out of your sideboard. Next up, there's Wizard's Rockets, which for one generic mana is a common artifact. It enters the battlefield tapped. You can pay X and tap it to add X mana in any combination of colors. When it's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you draw a card. This is never going to be efficient at fixing your mana because you pay one on one turn and then you pay X on another turn. So you overpay by one, but it is colorless fixing that replaces itself when you use it. And it's hard for that to be unplayable. Still, I don't think it's great. I'm giving it a C minus. Now it's time to move to lands, starting with Baradur, which is a rare legendary land. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. You can tap it and add black to your mana pool, and you can pay 2x in black and tap it to amass Orcs X. Activate only if a creature died this turn. Even if you only amass once with this, you're going to feel pretty good since it means you got a full card of value out of a land that has also been producing mana for you. That kind of value is very real and not something you get in most limited games. It will enter tapped a lot, especially in the early game, but by the middle part of the game, it has a reasonable chance at entering untapped, and that downside doesn't matter at all. I think this is a B-. Next, there's Great Hall of the Citadel, a common land that can tap for colorless. You can pay one and tap it to add two mana in any combination of colors. Spend this mana only to cast legendary spells. This can help you splash some powerful legendary creatures, I guess, but I'm a little skeptical. Most of these lands that normally only produce colorless but can produce colored mana for a certain type of card end up just not being worth it in limited. Producing only colorless for the majority of cards in your deck is a liability for your mana base, so it ends up sort of canceling out any upside you might have gotten out of it when you do have your legendaries around. You're going to want to go after different fixing than this most of the time. I think it's a D. Next, it's the Grey Havens, an uncommon legendary land. When it enters the battlefield, you scry one. You can tap it to add colorless, and you can tap it to add one mana of any color among legendary creature cards in your graveyard. This seems like it'll be able to add at least one color of mana to your mana pool by the middle stages of the game, and that's not bad on a land that also scries and has a potential upside of tapping for more colors. Still, there will be some awkward situations where you can only get colorless mana out of this, and that is kind of rough, giving it a C. Next up, it's Minas Tirith, which is a rare legendary land. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. You can tap it to add white, and you can pay one generic and a white and tap it and draw a card. Activate only if you attack with two or more creatures this turn. Being able to draw even one card out of this is going to feel great, as you normally can't get that type of value out of your lands. It will enter tapped a lot, which matters, but this still looks like it'll deliver enough value to make it worth playing in pretty much all your white decks, giving it a B-. Next up, it's Mines of Moria, a rare legendary land. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. You can tap for red, and you can pay three generic and red and tap it to exile three cards from your graveyard and create two treasure tokens. I'm not quite as impressed with the upside on this one as I am with the other two we've seen in this cycle. You have to invest a hefty amount of mana and have a well-stocked graveyard to get it going, and by the time you can get it going, getting treasure isn't usually going to be that big of a deal. Still, it's a land that has minimal downside, that can give you some value in the later stages of the game, and it's hard for that to be bad, giving it a C+. Next up, it's Rivendell, a rare legendary land. Enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. You can tap it for blue. You can pay one generic in blue and tap it to scry two. Activate only if you control a legendary creature. A land that scries is always a nice thing to have, and this has a fairly reasonable hoop for you to jump through to get there, as by the time you can start scrying with this, you're fairly likely to have a legendary creature in play, giving this a C+. Next up, it's Mount Doom, which is a mythic rare legendary land. You can tap it and pay one life to add black or red. You can pay one generic, a black and a red, and tap it to do one damage to each opponent. And you can pay five generic, a black and a red, tap it, sacrifice it, and a legendary artifact. Choose up to two creatures and then destroy the rest. Activate only as a sorcery. This is a pretty awesome utility land. We've already seen that lands that do something other than produce mana for you and then don't have much of a downside are pretty good. And this is another one of those. It fixes your mana for you if you're in a black-red deck. It can do damage to your opponent. Sometimes that can really add up. And then the most powerful effect of them all is also the hardest one to use, but you can wipe away the whole board except for two of your creatures. This land can do that. Now, it might sound impossible to ever activate that ability between the mana and the legendary artifact requirement, but there are actually a decent number of legendary artifacts in the set at lower rarities, so it's not impossible for you to have like two of them in your deck, to make Mount Doom do its thing. 
And either way, you still have a land that's great at fixing your mana that can pressure your opponent with damage. The only downside is you have to pay life for mana, but that's usually not that big of a downside. Overall, this looks really good to me, especially for a land, I'm giving it a B. Next up, we've got the Shire, which is a rare legendary land. It enters a battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature. You can tap it to add green. You can pay one generic and a green and tap it and tap an untapped creature you control to create a food token. So like all of these, it'll enter tapped in the early game most of the time. By the mid to late game, probably enters untapped, and then it gives you some real value. You know, a food token isn't worth an entire card, but there are enough payoffs for them. Gaining life itself can just be pretty good. For this to be another nice land. I'm giving it a C plus. Then there's Shire Terrace, a common land. You can tap it to add colorless. You can also pay one and tap it and sacrifice it to search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. So this is kind of like Evolving Wilds. It can't grab you a land for no mana the way Evolving Wilds can, but I think the fact that it can tap for mana in the meantime makes up for that, giving this a C plus. So those are the multicolored and colorless cards in Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. Tomorrow I'll be back with my thoughts about all the white cards. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you're watching this when there are more set review videos to watch, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.